You are now listening to the second podcast with. Who? Craig Jones. Who? Craig Jones. <laughs> and um, uh, having that guy around is the best thing that ever happened for the squad. Episode 10 of the El Segundo podcast. We're here today to report breaking news. That is that the Long Island serial killer, the Gilgo Beach killer, has been captured and is shockingly, as it turns out, not John Danaher. This was mind blowing to me because the whole time uh, I lived in New York, there were rumors of who the Long Island serial killer would be and I honestly couldn't think of anyone more apt for the job than John Danaher. I even spoke to a homicide detective uh, that trained at Henzo Gracie's about this. I was like, yo, bro, this guy might be, in fact, the Long Island serial killer. And he's like, he goes, I've already looked into it. John Danaher does not have a car or a driver's license. So he's like, I don't know how John would get the bodies all the way out to Long Island. That was one of the things. But he did look at me very seriously and say, he goes, man, in the whole time John Danaher has been in New York, I've always been looking to see if I can find a rash guard at the scene of a crime. But he said he's never found it. I assume he was looking for it because he would hide that evidence, you know? Like, that's the sort of tight-knit community Henzo Gracie was. You know, if you were to commit a crime, we make that go away pretty quick. It's a pretty cool crew. Yeah, but honestly, they killed this guy. This guy used to, sorry, they captured this guy. This guy used to catch, a, catch the, the train to Penn Station where I would catch the train to. His office was less than a mile from Henzo Gracie's. Oh, shit. But yeah, he's officially <clears throat> been charged with, like, killing three three or four hookers, but I think they found 10 bodies <clears throat> out on the strip here. What was this thing, like stabbing, fucking strangling? I don't know, I haven't done enough research into it. Something must be wrong with me because I listen to serial killer documentaries to go to sleep. So obviously I only ever get the first part of the case down. You know, like yeah. I get the intro, but I don't get the conclusion. I think his nickname was like The Ripper or something. So like... The Ripper, no, it was all right. So Long Island serial killer, Gilgo Beach killer, Craigslist killer. But yeah, this guy did some work. Yeah, it was a weird, I think it was some sort of weird, crazy thing where a girl called the police out on Long Island. It's like a, a prostitute saying she was being attacked by a guy. She ran off into the woods, disappeared. And when they went to find her body, they found a bunch of other bodies. Oh, sure. So yeah, Long Island, fucking, definitely a, definitely a strange place. Might be multiple serial killers operating out of there. Who knows? Those other five bodies still might be John Danaher. Because something, uh, a lot of people do know this, but if you're not too into jiu-jitsu, if you ever accomplish something when you train for John Danaher, you would be handed a knife. It might be a belt promotion, it might be you win something big, he would hand you a knife. And the idea was very philosophical that he's giving you, you're, you're like sharpening the blade, That's, that represents you sharpening your blade, which is what he said. <clears throat> but obviously from my perspective, I thought he was just, it would be a great way when the police arrested him, for him to have an excuse for his fingerprints to be on a weapon. That's sort of the level I think he operates at. But yeah, again, it wasn't John Danaher. It was uh, an architect that worked in New York. I don't know why. I watch true crime like a fucking 15-year-old single single woman. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm in deep on it. Yeah, yeah. We have a serial killer here in Austin, though. <clears throat> I mean, you, who knows? Oh, killing guys, throwing them in the river, yeah, this guy? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I remember people talking about this one. They actually did capture a serial killer here recently. There's a bunch of serial killers going on. They just captured one in Portland. But oh, yeah, shit. they captured some fucking old Mexican guy here that was killing people, I think, killing his here? neighbors. Yeah. Damn, I haven't heard about that one. I heard about the one with the river and stuff. The ri Yeah, the river one's weird because it's like, it's only dudes, but unless you're in, like, so they're finding dudes' bodies in the river. And obviously they speculate that it could be accident because you could get fucked up and then go piss by the river. And it makes perfect sense because it's like, you'd have to be an absolute savage of a woman to be like, hey, I'm just gonna go fucking piss in the river. You know, that'd be the type of woman <laughs> Nikki Ryan would date, you know, might even marry. But that explains why it's mostly dudes. But there are some shit in Austin. Austin's pretty wild. Like, um, obviously we have all the homeless battles out back of this place. But yeah, there's, uh, there's meant to be people drugging people and robbing them in, uh, what is it, Rainy Street, Sixth Street and stuff. So I don't know if these guys are getting drugged and ended up falling in the river, but a, f a fair few people are falling in the river and dying. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, sadly not the people we want, you know? <laughs> it's fucking too boring to be out partying on Rainy Street anyway, but 
Yeah, Austin. Uh, I mean, could potentially be a serial killer too. No. For, for me personally, I love. I will watch Forensic Files all night. They pick the best narrators for true crime shows. Oh, dude, absolutely. The best voices ever. The most peaceful, just low you to sleep type of voice ever. There's one guy, Keith Morrison on Dateline. This guy, the way he talks, you put me to sleep immediately. So I don't know whether it's my attachment to true crime or just the the narrators they use. The guy from Forensic Files is a legend. I hate that they took it off Netflix. Yeah, well, so every episode's free on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Oh, I gotta check that out. Um, yeah, he did FBI Files, Forensic Files. He's dead now. Oh, fuck. But maybe we can use the AI voice recreation oh, to bring him back to life. Fucking legend, dude. I love that guy. That, yeah, that guy was the number one. <clears throat> but enough about serial killers. Let's talk about some more breaking news. Quintet yeah. is back. So Quintet is the pre like I think personally the most exciting grappling events that have ever been put together were Quintet because they found a way to make stalling exciting. The worst part of our sport is when nothing's happening, right? But Quintet would be there'd be fourteen. It'd always be a four man a fourteen tournament, and each team would consist of five people under nine hundred and forty pounds or something. So you, obviously you could structure that however you want. You could get a couple of fucking giants and a couple of midgets in there you could have five even level guys but what would make it exciting would be that stalling could be strategic you know what i mean like if your team is not as good as the other team and you're facing someone that's really really good you know maybe an elite level guy on the other team you just like shit if i survive this guy's out of the mm -hmm. event because it's uh it's last last man standing so like we did an event Kinet kinetic and lachlan giles ran out a whole team he ran out oh, five yeah. guys so really, <clears throat> stalling becomes exciting now because if there's a skill discrepancy, it becomes fun to watch this really good guy try to beat a guy who's shelling up and it makes it like a, the team's environment, makes it so stressful because it's like you can't really warm up, you don't know when you're going to go. Once you elect your five-man lineup, you can't change it until round two of the event. But yeah, it was crazy exciting. I competed in, I think it was the original event, Team Polaris. We did it in Japan. We competed in the sumo arena, uh, which was pretty cool. What was funny about the sumo arena is in our warm-up rooms, they had the sumo bathtubs. Like, the, they obviously have to have a fucking massive bathtub, yeah. but, like, honestly, that might do pretty well in America, the size of that tub, you know? Like, there's a lot of people, especially just coming back from Vegas, a lot of people in Vegas that could require a bathtub of that size, yeah. for sure. But, yeah, competed Quintet 1, Team Polaris. We... Oh, fuck. Have I competed two or three times? I don't even fucking remember. I think two times. But first event I did, we went against uh, Team Sambo, which obviously, as we all know, has been well established for over 10 years now. Sambo is completely fake, Not completely bullshit. Something no one knows anything about, no one does. But I competed against this kid, and I put him in an e bar because heel hook's a band. They wanted to, like... You don't want to have some heel hook killer. It would just... It'd be a mismatch. Yeah. That's the idea. And Sakuraba's in the event, so it's like, you're not going to fucking break this older guy's leg. But the idea... Like, I competed against the Sambo guys, and I was like, you know what? Fuck these guys. I'm going to knee bar them. Knee bars are their moves. So I put this guy in a knee bar, and I hesitate. His knee starts to pop, and I just, like, I don't rip it because I was like, I felt bad. Like, sometimes you're like, if this is a skill discrepancy, sometimes you don't need to break someone's leg. That might be some advice someone needs to tell Big Dan. You're 300 pounds, like, you don't have to break a guy's leg, you know, like, yeah. just be a bit nicer about it. <clears throat> but yeah, the second time I put him in the knee bar, I was like, all right, well, fuck you, I rip it. Is that the famous picture that has, like, you don't know yeah, what limb is? it looks like five yeah, limbs, yeah. right? Yeah, this guy's knee. This was a worse <laughs> was break fucked. than the Vinnie Margalesh break, but it's sort of like less people know about it. But yeah, completely destroyed his leg. Didn't realize until I watched the replay. And then after I break his leg, I grab his hand to pick him up, and he steps on his leg, and it completely yeah. buckles inwards was disgusting i would have just killed myself then and there but we were walking around tokyo later that night and i saw him walking around he looked like a fucking baby giraffe or something every time he stepped his knee would buckle backwards inwards and he'd just keep walking like no crutches anything yeah. and i was like what the fuck's wrong with you crazy russians yeah, eh? legend is still went out to party and shit still yes yeah, went out had a good time but yeah quintess best event i've ever been a part of and it's uh an event that people that don't do jiu-jitsu could appreciate like I, I just checked uh, the other day team Polaris versus team 10th planet was on the quintet in Las Vegas right mm -hmm. so I think 10th planet won one quintet tournament team Polaris won another we faced off at the Las Vegas event which is like a sold-out crowd biggest event in jiu-jitsu at the time 
and we had a crazy back and forth battle where every single match ended in submission and just the drama of it made it so exciting for people that don't even do jujitsu. Like I don't think there's another event out there that you could actually show people that don't do jujitsu. Like even ADCC and stuff, it's like, bro, this is 48 hours. You know, like most of the time we don't, like people aren't gonna be invested in anything. But if there's four teams, the event's a two hour event, that's enough jujitsu. You know, yeah. this ain't an MMA event. We don't wanna watch fucking seven hours of this shit. So four teams, they pick a team, they get invested in it, like the primitive fucking NBA, NFL. You know, you just pick a team, you're invested in your team and you watch the drama unfold. So Quintet is back in collaboration with K1. That's huge. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was growing up, K1 was massive. They would do these eight-man tournaments. Even some Aussies and stuff did well in those tournaments, but they'd have some of the craziest kickboxing fights ever. Guys like Batahari, Semi Shield, Jerome Labana, Peter Ertz, all these massive names that fight in K1 tournaments. Most of the events in Japan, but they would host events. They even hosted some K1 events in Australia. That disappeared for a long time. And now it's back. So same night, it's going to be a K1 eight-man heavyweight tournament and a quintet tournament straight afterwards. Yokohama oh, Arena in Tokyo, going to be fucking massive. The teams that were announced were <clears throat> 10th Planet, Sakuraba's team, Team New Wave, and who was the fourth one? Polaris. M team Polaris, mm -hmm. right. I think Greg or Gracie. Is Dan Strauss doing it? No, no, they have uh, Owen, right? The yeah, so it's like... All right, so it's Owen, Mateus Sashinsky. He was in. I think he's out now because Euro Trials is a, a week after and he wants to focus on that. They've got um, Owen O'Flanagan. They've got uh, Santiri Lilius. Yeah. And then one That's more. It. Yeah, I mean, you, you name the Santiri, Owen, Gregor, Mateus is out, like you said, and yeah. O'Flanagan. All right, so I guess the only original guy from the original team is Gregor Gracie. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And then Sakuraba's team will have, obviously, Sakuraba, some other Japanese guys. Um, Hyasam Rida will be on that team as well. Tenth Planet is basically the original lineup they had, except they've switched out Adam Saknov with Kyle Baim. So they'll have Boogeyman, Geo, Geo. Kyle Baim, Amir Alam, and PJ, PJ Bart. So, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty stacked team. If... I don't know who I favor. I think those three teams could be potentially evenly matched. I think Hyson, his skill level is pretty damn high for Team Sakuraba. Oh, you know, like yeah. uh, Sakuraba, I think, was probably hoping he could just send Hyson Matty to kill five guys. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> some of the past events Hyson's done. Hyson really made a big name for himself doing um, yeah, yeah. the Quintet he events. He had the big match with Boogie and, and then Geo that same back to back. Oh, yeah. Crazy. That was some of the drama that creates, right? Because so one of the events, um, Hyson faces Boogeyman, submits him pretty submits quickly. Him. Yep. And then Geo, Boogeyman's brother, comes out and submits Hyson. So it's sort of like, if you beat my brother, I'll yeah. defend your honor. And then at the 10th Planet vs. Team Polaris, Marcin held Nibar's Geo quite quickly, which yeah. was pretty surprising at the time, yeah. only because Marcin's an MMA fighter. Geo's a full-time jiu-jitsu yeah, guy. Yeah, hard to submit as well. And then Boogie came out and defended... Um, Defended the family honor again by then avenging uh, his brother against Marcin Hell. So yeah, nothing in jiu-jitsu is as cool, as exciting, as fun as quintet. I don't think I can emphasize that enough. Like, and if you have any doubts about it, just watch Team Polaris versus um, Tenth Planet on YouTube. Fight Pass have released it. It's like a 45-minute segment. Every match ends in submission, and throughout it, it's like they get one, we get one, they get one, we get one. The drama is insane. It's got close to 2 million views. And I know a lot, like you could, some of the biggest matches on YouTube, depend, like in all of Jiu Jitsu, so a lot of them don't even come close to that. Flo released a lot of free matches as we speak now. And so even those, some from ADCC and stuff don't get a ton of views. So I think, and if you read the comments on the YouTube, um, YouTube comments, I love reading YouTube comments. Some of the funniest people in the world live in the YouTube comments. There's tons of people that are like, I don't even watch jiu-jitsu, I don't do jiu-jitsu, and they really enjoy quintet. Most people, like jiu-jitsu is a, uh, a participation sport. Like if you do it, you will watch it. But very few people watch it and don't do it. The only time that might be is if they're in a massive MMA fan and their favorite MMA fighter is doing a fun grappling match and they're like, oh yeah. fuck you, I'll watch, I'll watch some grappling. But for the most part, no. But quintet, I think it's sort of like well, that's why it was so disappointing to me that it disappeared. It was on Fight Pass 
Fight Pass tried to redo it themselves by making MMA teams, but it kind of lost some of the magic. It was still entertaining. I compete on the show, um, but it kind of lost its magic. Something special about Sakuraba being involved, Japanese MMA sort of involvement, because the, the biggest spectacle we've ever had would have been Pride. So it's sort of Sakuraba's trying to recreate some of that with this. So that, to me, it's awesome that it's going back to Japan. Like yeah. obviously the last event they did was Vegas. It's been years now. I think it's five years since I last competed for Quintet. So it's, the Quintet hasn't been around for a long, long time. Long time. Yeah. But yeah, super exciting. I think, yeah, this is gonna be a massive event. Other events out there will try to do team stuff, but like, to me, like obviously you could do it like a wrestling meet. You, your 66 faces our 66. That's cool, but I like the freak show of it, you know, where it's like, all right, our 66 beats your 66. Now he stays in, he faces your next yeah. guy, you know, and he has to submit the guy to win. And the referees are crazy with stalling penalties. Plus, something about the last man standing nature of it makes you less afraid to take risks. Because say I've submitted this guy and I'm, I'm staying in, I'm already coming in at a deficit. Yeah. So it's like, I really got to try to submit this guy fast and take some risks. And obviously, the, if you get submitted in a regular tournament, it sucks. But say you've beaten two guys and then someone submits you, it's like. Yeah. No, I like that too. It gives you that, uh, you get some matches that you no otherwise wouldn't see, you know, like again, Hysom versus Geo, you'd never see that in any other type of promotion, you know, so uh, I think the, la the s how they set it up kind of makes it really exciting for sure. Yeah, and it captures like that team vibe, you yeah. know, like it really, like you're so invested in it. You invested in it for two reasons. Obviously, it's your team. You want them to win, but also you want them to win so you don't have to fucking face off against too many people. Yeah. Like if one guy runs out four of your teammates, now you have to run out five of them. So it's like the drama of it yeah. is just, just wild. But yeah, that's it for Quintep. What else are we gonna talk about? I just turned 32. 30. Oh, shit, yeah, you had a birthday in fucking Zurich? In Z uh, yeah, actually, well, technically I was in I. Ibiza, Ibiza, Ibiza. I don't get this shit out. Eh? <laughs> like everyone always like, I'll say Ibiza and then they'll say Ibiza, you know, like. Ibiza. Whatever the fucking person you're having a conversation with calls it, just it. be polite and say it back. You know what I mean? Like it's a fucking foreign language. You, and the people that correct you on this aren't even from the fucking yeah. country, you know? Don't yeah. be so invested only been like once in the show. pronunciation, you know? Like you meet British guys and be like, it's Ibiza. And you're like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. You know, you're not from Spain. <laughs> Say it like a fucking white person, please. You know, so I don't even know how it's pronounced, but I try to replicate it. Because that's what you do yeah. in a polite conversation. <laughs> you say Ibiza, I say Ibiza. You say Ibiza, I say Ibiza. None of us needs to be fucking superior. Yeah. And you guys are talking about the same shit, you know? So it's like, fuck Yeah, we're both talking about the same. We're talking about an absolute hellhole of a party destination in sweaty fucking Spain full of British tourists that have the exact same haircut. Uh, all the dudes have the same haircut. All the women have the same thickness and density of eyebrows. But yeah, it's a fucking, it's a pl it's a wild place full of clubs with absolutely no dress code, no restrictions on drugs. Yeah. I switched it up. I tried to I tried to be a bit healthy on this trip. You know, like Vegas, we ran through a lot of cocaine and Molly. I said, you know what? I'll mix it up. I'll not only do cocaine and Molly. I'll do some ketamine too. Therapeutical. We did a bunch of Cat Valium over there, and it really did. I really did pay the price. Something I'd recommend: never go from Vegas to Ibiza. You're gonna come close to dying, which I did. But yeah, 32 now, which actually, according to the rules of the IBJJF, legally qualifies me for a full TRT anti-aging protocol. Obviously, something I haven't already been on for many years. You know, like uh, they say, age is how you feel. Well, I felt 35 for 10 years. Obviously, legally justifying my use of testosterone. But we are accepting a new sponsor. The spot you'd think the sponsor would have reached out. He would have been like, oh, Craig's a successful athlete. Let's sponsor him. But he reached out because he said, Freddie is the least masculine man I've ever seen in my entire life. This is how the call started. He said, you look like that creature out of Monsters, Inc. You know, you have a straight line torso the top to bottom. Uh, he said, we need to do bottom. something about this. We need to add some muscle mass to that. And I said, yeah, I would be happy to work with you to help Freddie reach his full potential okay. of puberty at the age. How old are you now? 31, bro. 31, yeah, so yeah. you're legally entitled. 
I was just waiting for the right time, bro. To testosterone <laughs> as well. Freddie's recently single, so he's obviously concerned about his testicles having babies. He is a Latin man. He is expected to have seven kids. So now he's single again. He's decided to rededicate himself to getting on some TRT. Definitely. The before shot. This is the before shot. Soon your hair will fall out. Soon your back will oh, be okay. hairy. Look at this lush shit. Don't be jealous of this lush <laughs> hairline, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. We'll put the dose right up. <laughs> but we're gonna ma we're actually gonna do we're gonna manage we're gonna show your bloods and shit everything right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, apparently part of the works already. So s sometime in the next week I'll be doing the blood panels and shit, and then show you guys that I'm a healthy man. And then uh, yeah, from there I'll be on some peptides for my knees. You know, trying to go down from 31. Maybe I want to feel like 25 again. Man, I'm honestly so lazy. I'm like to do a. I'm so addicted to caffeine, modafinil, and eating in the morning, right, that you, to do the blood panel, you have to be fasted. Yeah. So it's like, I would risk my entire health and of dying young just to not have the inconvenience <laughs> of driving to get my blood work done before <laughs> fucking having a coffee, you yeah. know? That actually gives me a little anxiety. I've actually had some... Uh spells where I fainted giving blood in the fucking morning. Really? You know, that no does food. not surprise me. Yeah, that does not surprise <laughs> me at all. So we'll see the what happens. The needle is literally thicker than your arm. Bro, they so took no like eight afraid. miles of blood, bro. No <laughs> breakfast, no nothing. You've got plenty of blood in you, mate. Not in the morning, apparently. You remind, my brother fainted too last time he gave blood. Absolute oh, coward like of a human six, being. Nine of a guy. You know? <laughs> you got lots of blood in you, mate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that shit, when, not the eating stuff scares me. But he's sure. now, we're going to have to now film you giving blood <laughs> and fucking <laughs> hope, said shit. hope you faint, eh? <laughs> hey. Listen, gonna... you will fucking both roll with Hysom and scrub his back in the shower after training and tell him you're scared to give a little blood. You've had, <laughs> fuck, you have thicker injections every day. Yeah, yeah, honestly, the injections definitely scare me more than Hysom. Hysom's a fucking pretty nice guy to me, but I can't complain. Didn't he just injure you? He didn't really injure me. He caught me crying. Kind of, oh, my knee, my knee. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was crying. My fucking knee really hurt. What really I hope is that I can make one training partner so frustrated and annoyed that they take that anger out on another one. <laughs> <laughs> he took that on me. That's the circle of life. You, you, had to, you had to leave the country for him to fucking take it on on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's the thing. Hey, I... I do better in the gym the more I'm away. And that's... I've come to the conclusion that's because... I have an unorthodox style. The more you roll with me, the more you like know the weird bullshit I'm doing. So like Nicky Ryan, with he's not full autistic, obviously not as good as his brother, but he's semi-autistic, you know, like he's a more healthy type. He's getting angry, playing video games, like he's that type of autism, you know, obviously not world champion level yet, but potentially, <laughs> potentially. But that's the thing, he's so analytical, I come back and throw some bullshit into the works and it just scrambles the system. Same with Joseph. Joseph's literally, he's basically uh, Mark Zuckerberg at this point, you know, like you can throw a spanner in the works and scramble the entire system. It's fucking, that's, jo Joseph I would say would be full autism, you know? Not a lot of people start rounds by fucking going, pulling side control like you, so you are fucking pissing off a lot of people. That's the, it's the rope of dope strategy, you know, like if I'm playing open guard and someone won't let me attach to them, give them something and now we've made contact at least, you know, plus, it's it's like uh, it's mind games, you know. It's like if so, if if I'm trying to pass a guy's guard and I keep backing up and he just gives me side control, I have to take it or I'm a coward. <laughs> you know, like he's giving me a good position. What I'm going to be like? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be like a fight where the guy's like offering you a punch. What are you not going to punch him? It makes you feel dumb and it fucking fucks the dynamic of the role completely. But what, what we're talking about? We're talking about Zurich. Yeah, that was my second time to Zurich. I go see uh, Augustus Frota. This guy's a trip. He is a Brazilian Swiss banker that used to fight MMA in Japan. That's mm. like a fucking absolute mystery of a human being. But he runs Froda uh, Academy in Zurich. He has a few gyms around. But yeah, he was who I was on the yacht with. You know, I, someone actually messaged me this, and I forgot about this joke, but Jerry Seinfeld had it best where he's like, he goes, you don't want to own the boat, but you want to be friends with the guy that does. Yeah. You know, that's the best deal. No responsibilities. You get a jump on there. It was a lot of fun. We went to a couple of different islands on the yacht. Fucked if I know what they were, but we had a <laughs> we had a really good time. The yachts, yacht life is a pretty good life, but I will say 
sleeping on a yacht, not too good. Yeah. Not too good. You know, like fucking. you're down below the fucking seasickness is much worse. You throw in a drug hangover on a yacht with a bit of fucking uh, movement, not nice at all. The most fun part was honestly, uh, you know, the sea deuce. Mm -hmm. So the like the underwater the jet underwater ski shit, things. Yeah. Those things are fucking awesome. Yeah, it just looks sick as fuck. Those things are fun. So that's like some of the fun toys we got to play with. Do you have any other toys besides that? Just that and drugs, really. Uh, <laughs> that's all you need. Safely in the right order as yeah. well. You know, I would never take that risk. Yeah. Last time I used to see do it wasn't like um, limited in depth. So I remember thinking I was a fucking fish and went all the way down, all the way up, just exploded my ears real bad. Eh? <laughs> that hurt for a while. This time I was more. I'm an older man. I'm a 32 year old man now. I'm more wise. I took a bit more safety precautions on that. But me and Nicky Ryan, we're back to Zurich end of the month for a quick camp. Fuck. We come back, Nicky Ryan, then he competes on WNO. I guess we break down, we should probably break down the WNO mm, card. Yeah. Eh? So Nicky Ryan making his return. Nicky Ryan, again, he competes at, once every four years. He's like the Olympic Games, you know, like it's a fucking rare thing to see Nicky Ryan compete. Yeah. I think he's, comp in his entire life, he's maybe had 12 jiu-jitsu matches, you know, <laughs> absolutely mind blowing. But August 10th, he faces Renee Souza. Renee yeah. Souza was on my team for the Who's Next reality show. Super cool guy. I've had a few beers yeah, with him. Yeah. He is a fun guy. Super cool guy. Buggy choke guy. But he's a scrapper. Like, that match will definitely end in a finish. Like, Renee's not going to... Renee's not... doesn't have it in him to really play a super like technical, safe, yeah, safe kind of win by a small margin. Like, he's going to go for the kill. Yeah. Um, but Nicky Ryan... Yeah, I mean, obviously... I. Uh, I helped guide that match. I favor Nicky Ryan pretty heavily in that match. But again, the one variable being Nicky Ryan competes every four years. So it's like you never know what you're going to get. You never know how the body's going to hold up. Obviously, in training, I do everything I can to injure him and make sure his body remains fucking <laughs> bad. Because if he starts to beat me too much in the gym, then I can't talk as much shit after retire properly myself. But yeah, that's sick. Nicky Ryan versus uh, Renee Souza. Yeah. We also have Ethan against Dante Leon. Yeah, that's going to be a scrap. 155? 155, yeah. Obviously, Ethan's coming in with a, a pretty big size and strength deficit here. Mm -hmm. But I believe, personally, he comes in with a pretty strong submission sort of advantage. Dante is on fire right now. But again, Ethan's... What was his last match against Fabrizio Andre? Mm -hmm. So he submitted Fabrizio Andre, shocked everyone. So he gets the Dante Leon match. That's not a title match or anything, is it? I don't believe so, no. But that'll be yeah, that, that'll be pretty exciting. Again, another match that's sick, because Ethan's, Ethan's never really had a boring match. Yeah. Dante Leon, too. Yeah, he's you, another scrapper. You want matches where both guys believe they're better, believe they can submit the other guy, and they'll go and try that. You know, you don't want a guy that you don't believe you can submit, because then you'll try to win by position or, yeah. or points. So I think that's a scrap. I think, obviously, Ethan's huge advantage there would be on the legs. Historically, Dante's had a bit of a weakness with the legs. Yeah. What's interesting about that one is they both have fucking crazy good cardio. Yep. So that's going to be a scrap for the full 15. Yeah, the whole 15, yeah. Neither one of those guys is going to get tired. We also have Heissam Rita against Philippe okay. Penner, which is a very interesting one. We break that down. Obviously, experience accomplishments. you got to go Philippe. Mm -hmm. Based on competing and training with Philippe and then uh, training with Heissam, Heissam definitely has a strength, speed, Advantage. I think he does have an advantage on the feet. I think he has to be pretty strategic the way he approaches Philippe on the ground because, yeah. again, Philippe being one of the best grapplers in the world. But, yeah, obviously, that's it's a, it's a winnable match for both of them. Um, Heissam sticks to the game plan. He wins the match. Philippe has... Pro oh, you have to be honest there. Given Philippe's experience, accomplishments in the sports, you'd have to imagine he has more paths to victory. Mm -hmm. But... Heissam Reader is a tough guy to control yeah. and implement a game plan on. Very hard to get a hold of him. Super athletic and shit. Yeah, very hard to out-wrestle him. He's training with Nicky Rod every day, so you know, like, training with Nicky Rod's good because it's like you're never going to really face anyone like Nicky Rod in competition. That's about as bad as it gets. Yeah. But that's a sick, sick that's match. a sick match, yeah. Main event, <clears throat> Kynan Dwarch, Nicholas Marigali. Um... I mean, I believe, having competed against both of them, obviously, I decisively beat Nicholas, uh, ADCC. Mr. Authenticity, at ADCC. Decisive, decisive. Um, Kynan Dwarch, 
I think I should have won that match. You know, obviously there was some bad calls by the referee there. A couple of penalties away from Didn't give me enough penalties. But yeah, Kainan is a scary proposition. That is the physically strongest guy I've ever felt. So it's like, that's a fucking problem. The only problem is you never know what Kainan's going to show up. Kainan has been heel hooked by everyone but me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> He's been heel hooked by Lachlan Giles, Spriggs, eh? Tim Spriggs, Cyborg. One of those names when it comes to heel hooks is not like the other names. You know what I mean? So it's like very disappoints me that I at least couldn't have done it one time. But the thoughts of a third match with Kainan, you know what? Like unless we had some better referees that would give me the full 15 penalties uh, I deserved, I wouldn't take that match yeah. again, you know? Merigali is incredible, making a ton of progress. Yeah, obviously I talk shit about the guy because he, he's fucking like, God forbid the work his therapist has to deal with on a daily basis <laughs> you know what i mean like that is an interesting character but you cannot deny he is fucking good but i mean the size the strength discrepancy in this match is crazy yeah. it's like a discrepancy between you and heisen reader you know what i mean it's, we're basically crossing the gender spectrum here <laughs> so kind of i mean obviously dds not dd danaher is going to have a good game plan to beat kind of but yeah fucking tough work yeah. I don't know how they're gonna ele like I just don't see like if you look at it what's what's Marigali's path to victory I don't know I mean Kainan has so much experience in Nogi compared to Mr. Authenticity so Kainan out wrestles him mm -hmm. for sure like I don't know how Marigali's gonna deal with those heavy clubbing collar types Marigali looks great wrestling against Lovato I don't think he's looked that good again like even when I wrestled Marigali he's, he was more picking up singles just to look busy for the mm -hmm. judges but there wasn't a real strong threat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Marigali's going to have to come out and just go after Kainan, put him on the back foot immediately. But if once you feel that power, it's going to make you hesitate from committing. So, yeah, I mean, I really struggle to, th to find a path to victory for Marigali. Like, I think he does get out-wrestled. He might not get past, but he will definitely be controlled from bottom. Like, maybe he wins a decision looking busier on bottom. But if he gets on top of Kainan, I think Kainan fucking sweeps him or yeah. even could potentially leg lock him something kind of did well was what he did against Mateus Denise he went saddle cross Ashi, whichever way you're inclined to say it there uh, and he hit the knee bar like the um, the knee bar from cross Ashi and just exploded into Denise's knee so it's yeah. like you're probably going to have a better chance of uh, catching a leg lock like that on Marigali than you are of exposing a heel hook because his team works so hard on heel hooks so Marigali's focus would be heel hook defense, but I mean, you got guys like Matus Sashinsky using variations of the straight ankle lock that are proven very, very successful. Very effective for sure. Working good as a way to counter uh, hiding the heel, you know? So, yeah, I just don't see Marigali winning that. Yeah, no. Um, Any other interesting matches on that card? Uh, I think you were just talked about the, the main. I mean, we have another guy going on there, JB. With Achilles, that's, that's going to be a Fuck, great, I forgot about that great one. Yeah. match. Yeah, we got JB. JB, one of my main training partners since we opened the gym. JB puts in the work. He's just waiting for his moment. You know, he's had, yeah. he had a really competitive match with Giancarlo. Oh, yeah. Really close, really close match. JB's real good wrestling. Um, if I could say anything, sometimes he has a bit of, like, uh, commitment issues in a match, you know, like almost a lack of self-belief. Mm. But, yeah, I think this is a very winnable match for him. JB's pretty disciplined. He's got great half guard, great wrestling. He's very disciplined, plays a very safe game. Achilles Rocha is like pure chaos scrapper. Yeah. Obviously, that works for him, but also causes him to make big mistakes. Like, he faced J-Rod, and J-Rod's breaking mechanics on the hill walk weren't perfect, and he just ate him. Yeah. But then he faced Stanley Rosa, hesitates to tap, completely gets his yeah, leg fucked. Yeah. And no matter how young you are, no matter how many steroids you are on, you're not going to fully recover from a break that bad in this short amount of time. JB's game isn't leg locks, but again, if someone's leg's fucked up, yeah, something to look for. But yeah, I imagine this is going to be a scrap where they both look to get on top, and whoever gets on top is going to have to be pretty tricky to find a way to play off bottom against the other guy. Achilles Rocha is probably going to shoot some wild take. He's going to get physical like his dad. You're not going to make friends with him yeah, during, the, during the match. But yeah, very winnable match for JB here. I also wonder how Achilles 
leg is going to fucking hold up. Again, Stanley Rosa, I've trained with him. I know how strong this fucking cunt is. So it's like scary, bro. What he did to that kid's legs, fucking brutal. Yeah, yeah. He's but, he's done some damage to some legs in the past as well. He's been... He's oh, yeah. I remember there was this guy, Quinton Rosenwig. He used to always call me oh, out. Yeah, he's actually yeah. pretty slick. He's got some pretty slick submissions. But I remember uh, Stanley straight ankle locked him very quick. When I used to train with Stanley, it would be like he would straight ankle lock me. And I would, like, l test it to the limits every day. Like, uh, I'd be like, fucking, either he's breaking it or I'm passing. Like, yeah. we'd have this battle every fucking day. Obviously, horrible for the body. I do miss training. Training with Stanley. But, yeah, like you said, he's fucking popped quite a few. Yeah. Popped quite a few people. He's known for that shit, for sure. But that's August 10th. That's here in Austin. Mm -hmm. Flow grappling event. We got any other grappling events coming up? Not big ones. I know Nicky Rod just has like a fight coming up next week. Oh, against Phil Fresh, right? Yeah. Very Phil weird bro. thing. Was it yeah. fucking Atlanta? In Atlanta, yeah. Apparently, like some guys just some rich guys throwing an event. Yeah, I remember. I heard he told me how much he's getting paid for it. I was like, holy yeah. fuck, bro. Nice payday for sure. I don't know. I mean, obviously, this guy's just gonna eat a massive loss. Like, I don't know what he's looking to get out of this. It's not on any broadcasting mm -hmm. networks, is it? No, no. I think it's supposed to be like they're barely even. They're not even selling tickets. I don't think. Really? Yeah. It's like very small, select. You know, I mean, I'm getting this from Nicky. I don't know how. Dude, honestly, it would be fucking sick to be a rich guy and make people have grappling matches in secret. You know, and yeah. not tell the public the results. Like, yeah. I'd love to just pay for these matches, just watch them fucking fight to the death, <laughs> and then only I know. Like, make the athlete sign an NDA. Yeah. I could just pretend the guy I like won. You know, and they couldn't say shit. Yeah. It'd be yeah. fucking hilarious. Yeah, and then J Rod has a match against I think one of the Ardilla's cousins or something. Um, oh really? Yeah. But J Rod's first match back since he. Shoulder destroyed his shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Jay's turned over an entire new leaf. Eh? Like Jay, it's funny. It's uh, the younger you are, the harder you get your heart broken. The more you look <laughs> to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Eh? Like he's fucking given up video games. He said he's given up fucking hentai porn. No he's, more candy for the kid. He really is no more candy either. Yeah, yeah, no more sugar. That was probably a wake up call when his brother's cholesterol was fucking through the roof. <laughs> eh? The boys look good, but behind the hood, they gotta fucking take care of that. It's a bit of maintenance <laughs> to it, you know. But yeah, he's fully. Re I remember he told me he was reading books, and I couldn't stop laughing. I was like, "There's no fucking way you're reading a book, J Rod. You're fucking eating crayons, cunt." You know. <laughs> yeah, he's got the hair going for him now. Um, yeah, but this match should be good for him. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know who the guy is. Eh? And JB said he had a match against the kid before. Um, not sure. I don't want to butcher the kid's name, but should be a great match for Jay. And obviously excited to see him get back out there for sure. All right, guys, so I haven't done complaining about fucking Europe yet. Eh? This shit's unbelievable. No one in Europe has a fucking air conditioner. You know, like, this makes me sound like the complaining asshole American. But it's true. I asked these people, like, why, why don't you have AC? And he's like, it's only hot two months a year. I'm like, two months is a fucking long time, <laughs> cunt. That's a you long know? time. Like, what, am I just yeah. not going to sleep for two months? <laughs> That is a fucking long. I mean, I'm used to the no AC thing. I lived in LA, but the weather is the same, January 1st to December 31st. But I couldn't live there. It was like hot for two, like way too hot for two months. Yeah. How I, the fuck do you sleep? I couldn't believe it though. Like Zurich is full of rich people. What are you tell me? You, you fucking drive a Ferrari, but you can't afford a fucking AC. <laughs> it makes zero sense at all. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. Like I don't get it. I. I mean. I guess, luckily, Vegas was so fucking hot when we were there. So it was like, I think one of the days was like 116, 117. Jeez. It's like, obviously, you need AC there. Yeah. But Europe, all the houses are fucking have this fucking thick insulation. So it's like, it feels so hot inside. Like, I'm trying to cool down. The hotel tried to offer me a plug-in fan. <laughs> I was like, what is... What is it, the 1960s cunts? Well, like, what are we doing here? Like, you feel like such an asshole complaining, but it's like, what do I have to pay $300 a night for AC? Probably, I mean, now that you're the pound for pound greatest grappler, you do deserve a little bit better. The pound for pound greatest grappler of all time should sleep with AC. That should be a fucking <laughs> mandatory minimum requirement to travel, yeah. <laughs> I don't know though, I, I, you, you get to that point where you want to complain about shit, but you also, you know what I mean? Like, I'm taking international flights for free to go do cool shit, and I'm like, fuck this, you know? Like, yeah. fuck this shit. No, something I've come to realize is there's not a single place on earth worth the time stuck in transit. Yeah, that's true. Like, nowhere on earth is worth a 16 hour flight, you know? Like, there's nowhere that cool. You're gonna find somewhere that cool close to your house. Yeah. 
Fair for enough. much less trauma. You know, everyone complains about the airport, but like enough flights will turn you into a mass shooter. You yeah. know, Americans must travel the most. That must be why they have the most mass shooters. You know, I get off a flight sometimes and think, fuck, I'm going to grab my gun. I'm going straight back to the airport. You know, staccato. Yeah. Staccato. Well, that's the good thing about staccato is obviously you wouldn't miss. <laughs> the people you wanted to kill would be dead. Yeah, I don't know. Fuck yeah, you've been on more flights than anybody I've known just in the last like fucking three months. Yeah, I know. That's, I mean, that's the problem is like if you take enough, you'll have a Xanax addiction. Fuck. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, am I taking these flights for business or am I taking these flights so I have an excuse <laughs> to take more Xanax, you know? Fuck. I spoke to a sleep specialist one time and he was mind blown because I remember one time I did quintet on a Wednesday and then competed in New York on a Saturday and he was like, bro, how do you manage your sleep? And I was like, Xanax and modafinil. And he thought I was joking. And he's like, oh, wait, really? I was like, yeah, I'm a fuck, I've been a drug addict for years, you know? I've been doing this for years. But uh -huh. it definitely, you need something to adjust. You know, you have to force a time adjustment. You know, like, if I'm traveling somewhere, when I get on the flight, if it, even if I've just woken up, if it's nighttime in the destination, I'll drug myself to sleep. Even if I've been awake all day, I get on the flight, I'll try to stay awake. It's the only way. you got to hit yeah. the ground running the destination. Yeah, and every time you do come back, you, like, train right away and shit, even if you come in late at night or something. You always kind of make it to the gym and sweat it out, so that yeah, you got you got to you got to tough it out. It's fucking, fucking brutal. But, yeah, just uh, if you listen to this from, from Europe, how about you don't be fucking cheap peasants and put some <laughs> AC in your fucking buildings? No wonder you guys die when there's a fucking, thir like, what is it, 30 degrees Celsius heat wave. That's why you're dying. I don't even yeah. know what 30 degrees Celsius is, bro. That's the right, let's be honest here. That's the right system. Zero degrees, that should be freezing point. Who says 30 degrees is, you know what I mean? That's some fucking yeah. retarded American shit. I don't shit know why they sure. made it that way, but. Some fucking retard in Texas came up with that for sure. <laughs> fuck the rest of the world. 30 degrees is when it gets cold. It's 30 degrees Celsius hot as fuck? That's a good temperature, it's a good temperature. Compa what's that, like 100 Fahrenheit? 30, I think 30 would be 80. 80 is nice. 80 is like LA. It was like 80. No, but I'm saying in Fahrenheit, oh. 30 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit's freezing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But zero degrees Celsius is freezing. Yeah. Like zero makes sense. Let's be honest. Uh, kind of, yeah. I just grew Europe, up with this, so Europe, that's what I know. Europe got that right. <laughs> they didn't get not, the AC system. But right. obviously not enough to develop a fucking air conditioner. <laughs> fucking blows my mind, eh? Speaking of other things, fucking well, actually, I can't even blame this on Europe. I can blame this on United Airlines, another pinnacle of American business these guns I, I wake up I go to bed at like 2 30 in the morning I wake up at 7 30 catch my flight canceled bang canceled and I will say this about United Airlines it's a business model us at B team stole when you try to call United Airlines <laughs> you can't contact them if you try to call B team you, we, we're uncontactable you know your only option to speak to B team is to an Instagram DM and hope we reply. But if you call the number, no one's answering. And that's something we stole from United Airlines. It's like, they messaged me and they're like, your flight's been canceled. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll call them up and rebook it. Almost <laughs> impossible, you know? Like, that's some brilliant business strategy. Yeah, but it almost got stuck in Europe. They were like, uh, no flights available until the 23rd. I was like, until the 23rd? What the fuck are you talking about? Like, there's so many flight cancellations around Europe. These cunts went on strike somewhere, caused so many problems. Fuck. I don't know, but I spent an entire day trying to get a new flight out, and then I flew I flew out of Newark, and I posted on my Instagram story, some cunt boarded the flight barefoot, and then I caught him after immigration taking a piss at the oh, urinal yeah. barefoot as well. <laughs> but that wasn't even the worst thing about him. It was the fact that he had three-quarter jean shorts on. That was far more yeah, disgusting. That fucking sketchy for sure. Than barefoot on a New Jersey, any, you couldn't be barefoot anywhere in New Jersey and feel safe, even at the beaches of Jersey, like barefoot is still fucking disgusting there, <laughs> you know, nowhere safe in that place. But yeah, when you get stuck overseas with some fucking flight cancellations and shit, some of the worst experiences of your life. I remember I was flying to Kazakhstan one time and the cheapest flight path there out of Australia was uh, through China, but a double layover flight through China. That's how obnoxiously large that fucking country is, yeah. right? So I flew into Shanghai or fucking wherever the first destination was. But my flight out of Melbourne, delayed. I land in China and she's like, yeah, you've missed your flight. They're actually taking care of me in Shanghai. They're like, yeah, you've missed your flight. And I was like, 
all right, all right. And then suddenly, she's like, no, your second flight was delayed too. We'll put you on that one. Bang. And I say to her, I say, but yeah, but what about my third flight? And she's like, someone will be at the airport to take care of you, right? <laughs> You'll deal so with I, it when you deal with it. I land at the airport, and it's 3 a.m., and this is far west China. This is like, uh, this is, it was Wurumchi. This is where the Uyghur people are. This is where the fucking, I don't even know if we can say, but obviously there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of tension between the Uyghur people, China, and I believe LeBron James, right? Was, <laughs> but I land in Wurumchi, 3 a.m., Minus 16 degrees. The airport's closing. There's, there's fucking Chinese guys with AKs that are like telling us to leave the airport. Oh shit. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> all right, go. Yeah. I'm not gonna fucking fight back against these people, you know? So I walk outside. I'm not dressed for the weather, for the fucking occasion, yeah. you know? At the time I was too poor to afford a snow jacket, you know, like what am I gonna fucking, <laughs> that's a fucking big investment. I go outside, there's no taxis. There's uh, just gypsy taxis everywhere. So all these, again, no one speaks English. They were just saying, closed, you know, get the fuck out of here, pointing guns at us. Which is, I mean, obviously if you work in an airport, eventually you're gonna make it to that point. But you know, but that was just the set business practice for this airport in Wurumchi. So I go outside, I get in a fucking ram random gypsy taxi. He takes me to a hotel. I'm trying to use credit cards, but in this part of China, no Western credit cards work but I had a tiny bit of Kazakh Tengi in my wallet, and the guy saw that, took it, and I go to sleep around 4 a.m. in this fucking hotel not knowing what the fuck's gonna happen. Again, I'm on a 24-hour transit visa. You overstay in China, what, like something bad's gonna happen to you for sure. Yeah, absolutely. The guy bangs the door and wakes me up like an hour and a half later, and he's like, like he's got Google Translate, he's like, not enough money. So he's kicking me out. But then he puts it up, he's like, I'm gonna take you to an ATM right now. So we get the only ATM in the whole city that takes American carts. Oh, sorry, at the time it was Australian. Australian no, I had an Australian yeah. card. As we drive through Urumqi, there's all these military checkpoints. Because again, it's like Muslim China, regular China's fucking very <laughs> tense location. And I went through multiple checkpoints where they took me out of the car, they took me into an interrogation room, they looked at my passport and they were like, you have to leave today. And I'm like, cunt, there's not a place on earth I'd rather be than getting the fuck out of here. Like, I'm like, I'm actively trying to leave. Yeah. You're like holding me up. Eventually I give the hotel owner money, go back to the hotel on hold for what felt like three days. No one would help me. Eventually the person on the phone's like, yo, just go back to the airport and look for your airline. So I go back to the airport, eventually find my airline. They don't, like, at the airport, no one speaks English still, but she found my booking and put me on the next flight out of there, and I was like, thank, thank God. God but then the next time I flew through China, mm -hmm. I got interrogated again, because they had no record of me leaving within a 24-hour period. Somehow I skipped out, and they didn't track it. And they were interrogating me as if I was a reporter, because it's like, who, what, what fucking <laughs> white person is going to Muslim yeah. China for vacation? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, I've had this vendetta with China ever since where it's like the airport experience is bad enough let alone the fucking immigration experience you know like yeah. I was meant to go on a, a trip to China recently uh, and they wanted my passport for a month to get a visa I was like a month jeez what the fuck are you talking about eh? your fucking social credit score is fucking down eh? wild <laughs> absolutely wild but yeah I mean obviously everyone has nightmare experiences traveling so it's like it's just part of it eh? but again as a person who's traveled most of the world nowhere's worth it you know like yeah. nowhere's worth 24 hours on a plane yeah. against a fuck next sitting next to a fucking fat retired guy like having a layover in the same country sounds fucking crazy du double yeah. double layover like how fucking settle yeah. down how big is that country surely there's <laughs> a just a fucking flight from our from shanghai to Almaty. you know why are yeah. we stopping in muslim That's muslim china but we got to talk. We got to talk. We got to be grateful for some things. Yeah. And something recently happened on the weekend that the whole MMA community will be grateful for. Holy Home lost again, and now I believe that should be the end of Holy Home main events. That's, That's like as we should basically take a moment of silence for that because we've had far too like we shouldn't have had one since she knocked out Ronda Rousey. You know that was yeah. that should have been it. But we've suffered through these for years. And now it's over. This event was very conflicting for me because it was like Jack Dallas fighting, mm -hmm. 
but so is Holly Holm. But then if I look at it, I think, hey, when there's a Jack Della co-main, we can just turn the event off after the Jack Della fight. Now Holly Holm's lower on the card, we have to, we can't, we don't have the same privilege. Yeah. But again, we are thankful that Holly Holm will not be made eventing anymore. 41 years old, that's probably, that's probably the end of her career. She got ninja choked, very extra, the guillotine choke. That was choke. fucking crazy, man. That's me making a confession there that I actually did watch the finish, you know? <laughs> very rarely is there a Holly Holm finish, you know? Yeah. But if she gets finished, I'll, you better believe I'll watch that shit. What's even going on with women's MMA now? I mean, Nunes retired. Yep, yep. A lot of rumors that Ronda Rousey's coming back or some shit. I don't nah, know if you saw that. Surely not. I, I read that. I was like, fucking please no. I mean, now that there's no one in that weight division for her, she probably thinks she could just jump in there and fucking. She became exactly what she hated a do nothing bitch, you know? <laughs> and really, we should all respect her enough to allow yeah. her to continue yeah. doing that, you know? Because the MMA world's a better place without her. Yeah, definitely, women's MMA is in a weird spot right now. Had women's that fucking MMA, woman yeah. just fucking twerking. Fucking Who's twerking? DC. Had that fucking that girl that, with the translator in DC was just like, come on, man, you didn't see that? That shit was funny. It was on the I same didn't line. Watch it, no. yeah, yeah. He like she she started twerking and fucking Daniel Cormier lost his mind. <laughs> like, <laughs> he like totally fucking fucked up the post fight interview. He should just walk away. Yeah, <laughs> well, they just started doing just scandalous shit. What do you reckon? I bet sometimes the guys like. He has to go in the interview, and he's like, for fuck's sake, I do not want to go in there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if the fucking person doesn't speak a lick of English, kind of makes it hard to... I love it sometimes where the, they'll ask a question, the person will respond in a foreign language for like three minutes, yeah. and then the translator will say five words. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know if he's lying or if he's doing us a favor by cutting that. Yeah. Or if other languages are much less efficient at no. getting a message across. That's honestly. gotta be like... For, like if you tell me to repeat something I'll forget half the shit while I'm saying it so he's probably like man they talk too long I only remember this bit yeah <laughs> how the fuck are you supposed to remember three it'd minutes it'd be so good to completely misrepresent what they said too <laughs> you know like just talk heaps of shit say some racist yeah. shit some sexist shit <laughs> fucking homophobic shit that'd, that'd be, be a awesome, good translator that's how you get some good ratings and fucking people watching your shit um but yeah, that card was fucking... If only Drickus said a different language and the translator just made it sound way racist. <laughs> <laughs> to ignore... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would have been fucking something. Um, Fuck that. We should talk about that. That fight's off now. Yeah, yeah. Drickus... Um, hurt his foot or some shit. Yeah, hurt his foot. And guys, people talk shit about Izzy, but like, like he said, he's never pulled out. He's had five fights in 12 months before. Mm -hmm. Drickus will never get an opportunity this big. Obviously... He can wait, because Sean Strickland's going to lose. We all know Sean Strickland's going to lose. Sean Strickland knows Sean Strickland's yeah. going to lose. If the guy didn't shoot a <laughs> takedown on Alex Pereira, he's not shooting a takedown on Izzy. And if he does, it's not going to go well. Yeah, like, not he's not going to get it. So, it's like, Dr Drikus? is it Drikus or Drikus? Drikus? Drikus is, like, he's missing a massive opportunity to fight in Sydney. Sydney's a good location for him, too, because there are a ton of South American, South Africans that live mm. in... Uh, Australia, yeah. so he would have some sort of. Uh, I don't even know. I should be careful how I say this, but he should. Be, he should. Ha he would have some support. Yeah, yeah. You know, obviously, most people are going to be going for Izzy in that part of the world there. Uh, but yeah, that fight would be massive. I'm yeah. just shocked. I felt like he got out of the Whitaker fight pretty unscathed. Again, we can't speculate yeah. on how bad the injury is, but Izzy tore his MCL a week before fighting a guy. He had already lost to three times yeah. and still took the fight. He could have easily pulled out and rebooked that later. Like, there's not a chance the UFC wouldn't have done Izzy Pereira for at any time he wanted. You know, so it's like for Drickus to pull out nine weeks out with an injury in a car, like, I think it's going to probably sell 50,000 seats. Yeah. It's huge. Like, it's like, if he, even if he does MSG. That's not going to be 50,000 seats. Yeah, cents. it wouldn't be as big. I wonder if... Uh, and it's region up? locked, you know? Like, Izzy's uh, obviously heritage from Africa, but in terms of Australia and New Zealand, gonna be, it's going to just be fucking massive. So I'm yeah. just... I don't think... Uh, I think he's missing the point there, you know? A bit like... Oh, big time, big time. Yeah, I mean, I must imagine the Sean Strickland fight would be pretty big. He's got to talk a little bit of shit. Yeah, he is he funny. He does. Fight. He does talk a bit of shit. It's funny, it's like... It's like I remember when Izzy, uh, 
Who did Izzy fight when Strickland fought Pereira? Uh, wasn't it Cannoneer? All right, so Izzy Cannoneer press conference and uh, Strickland, Alex Pereira, their press conference. Yeah. So Strickland was talking a ton of shit. Oh, yeah. I was with Izzy directly after that. Like, he loves it. Like, he might seem flustered on stage and shit and throwing insults back and forth, <laughs> and you guys might see these guys that look pretty emotional when you get hit with an insult or something, but it's like, behind the scenes, they love it. That's dollar signs to them, yeah, you know? Oh, so it's sure. like, the the press would be very fun for Strickland Izzy, but it's only nine weeks away. It's not signed. Mm. I mean, you know what's funny is sometimes, I, I was hearing from some of the managers, sometimes they don't sign the fight till the day of. No way. How, do the, how does the UFC guarantee they even show up? <laughs> That's, That's leverage. That's fucking ballsy, bro. So they'll, they'll like, sometimes they'll like, um, announce a fight it's like even I don't want to say who but some of these guys don't sign the contract till they're already in Vegas and shit yeah fuck man. so yeah. it's like obviously they have to be pretty sure Strickland is he's going to happen to to take full advantage of all Strickland's shit talking yeah Strickland will for sure cross the line on some of the things he says oh, though dude, for this one nuts. Australia is pretty soft so I'm not sure if everything yeah. he says will go down yeah. <laughs> to, as fun as well over there <clears throat> another fight they got announced that I'm sure you'll fucking love fucking Paulo Costa and Hamza man yeah, I think Paul Acosta wins that fight. You think so? Ah, but fuck. I'm not sure if they even show up. I think that's also uh, Volkanovski, Islam, like I thought was going to happen, and then they announced Oliveira. I'm not yeah. sure what happened there, but it seems the theme, it's like uh, fucking sort of Muslim versus Brazil. That's both main and co-main, mm -hmm. so it's like keeps with the theme. Paul Acosta, fucking hilarious. I remember he plugged me for the jiu-jitsu his gay shirt on the Fight Pass Invitational and he's like thank god I'm a wrestler <laughs> <laughs> Polo Costa is fucking he's fucking hilarious funny though I just don't see how Hamza loses that fight man I just see Hamza taking him down and doing what the fuck he does I mean yeah you're right if, it's, if, it, if that's a fight Polo Costa's cardio is not great yeah Hamza has terrible pacing issues I mm. think the first guy to survive two rounds in a five round Hamza fight finishes him yeah. Because well, he saw Gilbert Burns, he yeah. got exhausted. He was fucking dead. I the pace he set against Kevin Holland, exhausted. So I think, like, obviously, him's at Izzy. That's a five-round fight. That's a fucking sick fight. And, the, like, Izzy does not get tired. If Hamzat doesn't submit Izzy or TKO him quick, yeah. it's a long night. I think Izzy, I think Hamzat uh, is actually something I fuck up with, too. You have a pacing issue. Yeah. You go too hard, you go too crazy too early. Like, just... If you have any doubt about it, rewatch Hamzat versus Kevin Holland and ask yourself if there's any human on earth that could do that for 25 yeah, minutes. I don't think tough. there is. No, no. Uh, yeah, the Gilbert fight, I felt like he fucking wanted to stand up and trade, um, and that wasn't going too well for him. Paul, I don't think you can break Paulo Costa mentally too much either. Like, he's going to, like, if you talk shit, fight a bit dirty, he's going to do the exact same thing. Yeah. And he's sort of thriving that. I thought that, that Izzy kind of fucking mentally broke him a little bit. The against the, Polo, yeah, yeah. I feel like, uh, yeah, but that was a technical masterclass. Yeah. I don't think Hamzat can do that, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. On the, on the feet, absolutely not. On like grappling, bro, if he takes him down, but this is Hamzat's first middleweight fight, right? I believe, well, actually, so. Holland was technically a middleweight, but yeah, because he didn't make weight, yeah, but that's, yeah, man, Polo is enormous, yeah, he's a Hamzat's now going to be fighting people the same size as him, yeah. I remember those times Hamza was just touching people and they were falling. Yeah, that'd be interesting, bro. That's a that's actually like one of the. I'm way more excited for that. Yeah. Than Islam Oliveira. Yeah, yeah. I bet, imagine that Islam didn't want to do the fucking. Dude, it's crazy because it's like if you look at the character of Volkanovski, Volkanovski beat Max Holloway two times, and again the second one was controversial, but he went back and did it a third time mm -hmm. and completely outclassed Holloway. If Islam is who he says he is then why did he choose to take on Charles Oliveira, a guy he smashed? If, like, the, the most respectable thing he could have done is after that fight, yeah. not just kept saying, I won, but say, hey, I'm not happy with that performance. I can do better than that. Let's do that's it again, really and I'm going to smash him. Yeah. That's what he should be doing here. But the fact that he doesn't say that and he takes the Oliveira rematch, it, it confuses me. Again, like, Vol if Volkanovski, shoes on the other foot, he demands, yeah. no matter what his body's like at that time, he demands to do that again. So I think it just shows the difference in character between those two guys. Islam and Volk was in Australia, the first one? Yeah. I wonder if he just didn't want to fucking do that. In well, it was in Abu Dhabi, he would have had all the perks this yeah. time. No one would have cared about anything. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure, man. That's definitely interesting. How do you think the Islam, uh, what's it called, the um, Charles fights go the same way? It depends how much Charles changes the game plan. He looked pretty fucking good against Dariush. Yeah, yeah. It's tough, though. It's tough. It's that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if Charles beats him, they're doing a they're doing a rubber match, you know. So that division's held up. Then I'm assuming that opens up the door for Volk and Ilya. I love Gaethje and Poirier, but no one really wants to see them fight for the belt no. again. And it's not even the real belt; it's the fucking BMF title. Yeah, man, but I'm saying whoever wins that, oh, yeah. I don't think anyone. Yeah. Yeah, that 155 from being the most exciting division for a while kind of stalemated a little bit when Islam became the champ. If that, I mean, they did Volks Islam too. Suddenly, fuck, it's like Volks, <laughs> Volks against a ton of 155ers reignites the division. Mm -hmm. He beats Islam decisively next time. Super exciting. But it does this point because Volks is 34. Coming into 35, it's like uh, obviously there's that post-35 curse in MMA and it's like, fuck, give this man the fights he wants when he wants them. He's done more than enough. He's done more in this sport yeah. than guys like Islam and stuff. For and sure, staying active and shit, like you said, fighting all the fucking time, injury or not, not injury. And like, Tapori is not. It's a kind of un uninteresting, uninteresting. I think that's like. I'd rather see him fight Patty first. Patty. Yeah. What what ever happened to that guy? Eh? I don't know. He kind of burnt out a little bit. Um, but they were talking a lot of shit to each other. I felt like that would have been a fucking good, a good fight. But yeah, I don't feel like Ilya's done enough to. I mean, look at Max is like killing every fucking person who is like. Max is facing a zombie off. That's fucked yeah. up. I feel bad about that. I said, <laughs> yeah. I even said to his uh, Max's manager, Tim uh, or Tim and Morsey, I was like, bro, that's fucking rude. Eh? Yeah. Zombie's a nice guy. Yeah, I mean. He's taking enough damage. He's fucking fought everybody already. Unfortunately, if it wasn't for Volk, I feel like Max would probably still be champ, man. Like he's just killed anybody besides Volk. Me and uh, Max Holloway have the same curse, you know, respect. <laughs> we'll end it on that, guys. El Segundo, episode 10. Check the comments to sponsor our podcast. Thank you for listening to the El Segundo podcast. Don't forget, fuck cry Jones. <laughs>